class and maybe two or three times on uh, YouTube, and uh, I can understand it almost with all that. So just thank you, Lord, for all the things you do for us. You're, you're a blessing for us, Father. The way you created us and everything around us, and the way you created your word, and uh, put it down in writing so we can read it and remember it and live by it. Thank you for Kathleen, the way she brings the word to us so that we can better understand it. Thank you, darling. In Jesus' name. Good morning, dear awesome God. It is an honor to be in your house today. And we thank you, dear Lord, for this family that we are a part of. We are so blessed. And dear God, we just praise your name. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Holy Spirit. We thank you, for you have made the truth alive and at work in us. And dear Lord, your word, it truly is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Every time I come to church, and I know it's the same for all of us, we learn about something and we can apply it to our everyday lives. Dear Lord, we give you all the honor and all the glory, for you are in control. You know each of our hearts, each of our thoughts, and you know our troubles, you know our concerns. And dear Lord, you know where we doubt and where we might have fear. And dear awesome God, we thank you that we don't have to have doubt or fear, that we can rely on you and your truth, that you are able to do what you said, and you will do it in your perfect timing which works out best for us. I pray, dear Lord, and we all pray together that we would glorify your name in our actions and in our thoughts, and we thank you. Please open our hearts and minds up today to wisdom and knowledge, to understanding and belief, and this we pray in your holy name, our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Honey. Again. Thank you. Good morning. Christ is risen. And we are looking at the book of Zechariah today. So if you can remember, I told you three things last week about the book of Zechariah and the man Zechariah. What can you tell me? Somebody. Temple prophet. He was a temple prophet. Who was the other temple prophet? Jamel? Haggai. Haggai. Good job. So tell me another thing that we've learned about Zechariah, other than being the temple prophet. Yes, sir, Tim. Very good. A post exilic prophet. How many were there? Three. The last three minor prophets were Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Okay. And Pastor is teaching us Malachi, which I told him thank you very much because it'll save us a whole lot of time in here. Yes, Karen. Yes, he was one of the minor prophets. How many minor prophets were there? Well. Oh, you guys are doing so well. The, the um, minor prophets are the 12 books of prophecy after Daniel. Those are all the minor prophets. So if you would look at page 54 in your lesson, it's several pages back from today. It, it is the paper that says interesting facts about Zechariah. And if you don't have that, we will put some more out for next week. Raise your hand if you don't have the page interesting facts about Zechariah. Okay, if you, okay. So, uh, Dursella, you don't need to copy them today, but have them for us for next week, all right? Because it's some really interesting facts in fact, you already know many of them because I've taught them to you. So be sure and look at that page. This is a picture of uh, Zachariah, and it doesn't look very, it's not very good on the uh, PowerPoint because it is so dark, but that was painted by one of my favorite Bible artists, uh, James Tussaud. And if you Google him, you will find James Tussaud and a lot of his biblical art. So, let's look a little bit more about uh, Zechariah. Um, Dursella, can you turn the lights off just for a second? And Lyndon or, or Rob, Rodney. Rodney, <clears throat> I want to tell Rodney, stay right back there and everybody look at Rodney. Rodney has a, a ministry that is so very important. And Rodney, we appreciate you and you send me all of these good notes. Thank you for your ministry. Rodney. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is a painting by Michelangelo of Zachariah, and it's on the Sistine 
chapel ceiling. So be sure when the next time you're in Rome, Italy, that you go to the Sistine Chapel and you will see this painting. Leave your cameras in your purse or your pocket because you will get in trouble if you take a picture of the Sistine Chapel. I tried and um, you mustn't do that and you mustn't talk in there. So uh, that, both of those things are really hard for me to do. Not to talk, not to take pictures. But this is Zechariah done by Michelangelo. Zechariah was one of the 12 minor prophets. He was one of the three post-exilic prophets. And he was a contemporary of Haggai, the other temple prophet. So look at your page 58 in your notes. And we've already done a section of that. Page 58, Roman numeral 1, letter A. Uh, Zechariah was one of the 12 what? Minor prophets, and when the Jews say the twelve, when they're talking about the Bible, and they say the twelve, you will know now that they're talking about the twelve minor prophets. He was one of the three, what? Post-exilic prophets, and a contemporary of the prophet Haggai. They are called the temple prophets. And because, this is letter number one, they are called the temple prophets because uh, they spoke at the same time. When did they speak? The second year of King Darius. Good. Does anybody know the date? 520. Yes, 520 B.C. So that's 520 years before whom? Christ. That's right. Before the time of Christ. So they spoke at the same time. The second year of King Darius, 520 B.C. Darius was the king of what nation? Persia. Persia. And really the empire of Persia. And Zechariah and Haggai spoke in the same place. Where did they speak? Jerusalem. Yes, Jerusalem. <clears throat> and third, they spoke of the same topic. This is why we call them contemporary. The same time, the same place, the same topic. And what was the topic that they taught about and talked about? You guys are so good. That's right, the rebuilding of the second temple. What happened to the first temple? It was called Solomon's temple. What happened to it? Destroyed by Babylonians, the king of Babylon was named Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar had his army destroy Jerusalem. He plundered the temple. He plundered the palace and took all of the wealth and all of the people to Babylon. And it was how many years before they started coming home? Seventy years, that's right. So this is why they're called the temple prophets. And I'm, I want you to know I'm really pleased with what you're learning and what, how you answer these questions because this is stuff that most of us don't know. We have neglected this part of our legacy of the Christian faith. We've neglected this. Uh, so page 58, number 1, letter A, Haggai and Zechariah are called what? Minor. Okay, minor prophets. Let's call them the temple prophets, okay? You can call them all that, post-exilic, minor. But in this note, I wanted you to say the temple prophets because, letter A, they spoke at the same time. That was the second year of King Darius, 520 B.C. Where did they speak? In Jerusalem. And what was their topic? That's right. And they were encouraging the people to rebuild the temple. And Haggai even actually went out there with his hammer and nails and helped them rebuild the temple. So they were. when we look at Zechariah, we find that he was both priest and prophet. And we don't find many prophets also being a priest. And we don't find many priests being a prophet. But Zechariah, we're going to learn. This is real interesting and very important for you to understand. Zechariah was the beginning of a transition in leadership in the nation of Judah. 
all the way from way back to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We see that the Israelites were led by the patriarchs. And then after that, when they came out of, out of slavery in Egypt, they were led by judges, okay, and by prophets. They were called prophets. And then we find that they were led by, after, King, after the last judge, we, we find that they're led by what? Kings. And then, and then uh, once the kings were gone, then they were led once again by the prophets. And then finally, uh, the priests and the, uh, the priests and the prophets became kings, became the leadership because there were no kings. And so we're going to see that. And so when we're looking at um, the, the years between the Testaments, the 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, their priests were the kings. And God has always said the priests and the kings have to be separate. The priests had to come from the which tribe? Levi. Levi. And the kings would come from the tribe of what? Judah. Judah. And so yet we find in those 400 years between the Testaments, the priests and the kings were the one and the same. We're going to be studying that. But we see that Zechariah is the beginning of that, and he is the transition between the priests and the kings. But we'll talk more about that in a few weeks. So let's look at this, the difference between priests and kings, all right? A priest spoke for the people to God, and that is number two. two. Zechariah was both a priest and a prophet. A priest is the one who intercedes for the people. He is the intercessor. He is the one who goes to God for the people. Now today, we don't need a man priest here on earth because we have the great high priest. And who is that? Jesus Christ. Christ. So we have that a priest spoke for the people to God. Now I want you to look, because this is important, um, lights again. The priest wore this breastplate right here. And on that breastplate were beautiful, beautiful, expensive stones, different stones. There were 12 stones. Each one of those stones represented one of the 12 tribes. So 12 stones, 12 tribes. So as that priest prayed for the people, he had represented on his heart the 12 tribes. And he also carried the burden of the 12 tribes. So on each shoulder he had six stones and six stones. Each of those stones represented the 12 tribes as well. So they were on his heart as he prayed for them. They were on his shoulders as he carried the burden of the nation of Israel. And so you will see the little stripes on the shoulders and that's what holds this apron up. And that is the 12 tribes and the 12 tribes and the 12 tribes. And so just don't forget that because it's interesting and I'll show you how that will work again as well. So the priest spoke for the people to God. That's letter A. A priest is an intercessor and a petitioner. He speaks for whom? The people to God. And then we're going to find that the prophet, and this is letter B, a prophet is God's messenger. That means he brings the messages, the word of God to the people. So he uh, is God's messenger. He speaks for God to the people. And this is a picture. (laughs) Oh, I hope people don't get tired of me. Can you see that picture? Okay. This is a this is a picture of um, I think it's probably uh, I think as I remember that is a picture of the prophet Jeremiah and he is receiving a message from God. Yeah, turn that light off. There you go. He's receiving a message from God and he's giving it to his scribe and the scribe writes the message. Now I don't know if that was true of all of the prophets that they all had scribes, but we do know that Jeremiah had a scribe. Does anybody remember 
Jeremiah's scribe's name? Barak or Baruch. It's B-A-R-U-C-H. It's, it's a good thing just to know because when you read the book of Jeremiah, you will meet this scribe throughout the book. And when Babylon came into Jerusalem and took the people into exile, there were two men that we know he left in Jerusalem. And that was Jeremiah and his scribe Baruch. And he asked Jeremiah, did he want to go to Babylon? And Babylon, I mean, Jeremiah chose to stay in Jerusalem. The few people who were left forgot to trust God. And he, God said, do not leave Judah. And yet the people decided on their own to go to Egypt. Why would anybody in Israel ever go back to Egypt? What happened in Egypt? Slaves. Slaves. And God, through Jeremiah, said, do not go back to Egypt. But they did, and they actually made Jeremiah and Baruch go with them. And that's where we think Jeremiah died, was in, uh, was in Egypt. So, but that's the prophets. And they spoke for God to the people. God gave them, thank you, I'll take my lights again. God told the people of Israel that there will be false prophets and there will be true prophets. And he told them how to tell the difference. Does anybody know how God told the people of Israel to discern between false and true prophets. Yes, Jamel. He said if, if they say, thus saith in the name of the Lord and it doesn't come to pass, he's a false prophet. That's right. It must come to pass. And if they say, thus saith the Lord, they're speaking for God and God does not lie. And so if their prophecies didn't come true, uh, and he, I think he even said stone them, if they gave false prophecies. Doug? That's true. That's true. That's true. So, but some were immediate. Some were immediate. All right, let's go to, the, let's go to letter number three. Zechariah was born in Bethlehem into a priestly family. This is interesting because, what did I say? Close. I don't know why y'all are so picky. Why was I thinking Bethlehem? I don't know. All right. Oh, because it looks from over here from the side view. Looks like Bethlehem. Huh? All right, he was, he was born in Babylon. And I'm going to show you some things. Because you see, in the scriptures, if you don't really, really study, you're going to miss a whole lot of this. We are introduced to Zechariah in Ezra chapter 5. We're introduced to him. But we really don't learn a lot about Zechariah uh, until we study the scriptures in more detail. You're going to, we have to go into Nehemiah the book of Nehemiah, to tell us a little bit more about Zechariah. And he tells us a little bit about himself in his book. So let's look at his lineage. And I really hope you open your Bibles to Zechariah because this is important. Zechariah 1, this is where he introduces himself. And I've told you over and over that when we read the prophets, there are two things we must, must look for in order to understand the prophets. The first thing is we have to look at when it was written. Because if we don't know when it was written, we do not understand the context at all. So we have to know that this is the post-exilic prophecy. And what's the other important concept we need to know besides when it was written? Who said that? Thank you, Lori. To whom it was written? So in Zechariah... Chapter 1, verse 1, I'm going to find it. And I don't know that Pastor has told us who Malachi wrote to, but um, we'll talk about it. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of... Oh, that's Haggai. <sighs> I knew that was wrong. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius... 
the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah. So now we know when. And if you go back to your chart of the Persian kings, you'll see that the second year of King Darius was um, whenever. 520. Thank you, 520. And we know also who his father and his grandfather were. He was the son of Berechiah. And the reason we call that Berechiah, it's like Jeremiah. It ends with an I-A-H. Berechiah. And Berechiah was the son of Ido. All right? Now then you say, okay, who was that? Well, let's look at our notes and see if we can find it. Uh, we know that that was the priestly line of Aaron and the tribe of Levi. So let's see how we know that he came from the priestly line of Aaron the tribe of Levi. Guess what book you have to go to? You have to go to uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. So let's look at Ezra chapter 2. Everybody flipping back there? Ezra is a history book. Three history books, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, the last three books of history. You've got to read them with the prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. If you don't, you won't understand any of it. So Ezra chapter 2, verse 36. All right, now this is chapter 2, and we reviewed this last week. When they came back from Babylon, this is their first return. Ezra records the families who came back. Some really interesting study, but look at verse 36. A whole group of priests came from Ezra 2. In fact, there were more priests than anybody else who returned. And they couldn't act as a priest when they returned to Jerusalem unless they could prove their lineage. They had to prove they were from the uh, line of Aaron and the tribe of Levi. They had to prove that. And I think, how did they, re how did they do that? Well, they had to take all of, their, all of their papers with them to Babylon. And they had to take good care of them for 70 years and bring it back home to prove that they were a priest. So the priests, in verse 36, uh, if you go on down to, verse, to the end of that and add those numbers, you will get 4,389 priests came back. Okay? If you add those numbers. You see the numbers I'm talking about in Ezra 2? Uh, so 4,400 priests returned from exile. That still doesn't tell us that Ido was a priest, does it? So let's look over at Nehemiah chapter 12. Just go to the next book, Nehemiah. Of those 4,400 priests, what did I say? Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 4. Uh, Nehemiah, by the way, we think that Ezra wrote Nehemiah as well as Ezra. In the Jewish Bible, Ezra and Nehemiah are one book. So for the convenience of us, somewhere way back, they separated the two books. But Nehemiah gives us uh, the names of some of those priests who returned. All right, let's look at that. Chapter 12, verse 1. These were the priests and Levites who returned with Zerubbabel from Ezra 2. And you go to verse 4, and who is one of the priests in verse 4? Ido. And that's how we know Zechariah was a priest, because his grandfather was a priest. And that's how you became a priest. It was a fam handed down from the family. Now, I find that really cool, don't you? That you kind of have to just dig through the scriptures to find out who Ido was, so that way we know Zechariah was a what? Priest. A priest. And now he's functioning in our Bible and in our lessons as a prophet. So we see him acting as priest and prophet. So let's look at number three. Number three, Zechariah was born into what kind of family? A priestly family. We know he was born in Babylon because... His grandfather came, and he probably came over here with either his grandfather or his father. And how many of you have been reading 
Lynn Austin's books on the Chronicles of the Return. Aren't they wonderful? Awesome. Naomi says they're awesome, and it just brings all of this stuff alive. So get the Chronicles by Lynn Austin. Um, let's see. He was the son of whom in letter A? Berechiah. And Berechiah was the son of Ido, of the priestly line of Aaron of which tribe? Levi. Remember, there are 12 tribes. <clears throat> Only one tribe could be the line of the priests. God really intended for all 12 tribes to be priests. Did you know that? You'll find that in Exodus. He intended for them to be a priestly nation. A priestly nation. But when they rebelled against God and built that calf, then uh, it, it, he just reduced it to that one tribe of Levi. And so that's some interesting studies as well. So much we have to study. All right, did I get all that? Mm -hmm. So Ezra 2, 36 through 39, this is little b. How many? 4,400 what? Priests. Priests. And you'll find that in Ezra 2. Return to Jerusalem with whom? Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, almost 20 years earlier. Letter C, Nehemiah 12, 4. Who was one of those 4,400 priests? Ido, the grandfather of Zechariah. Now, let's, let's we know Zechariah as both what and what? Priest and prophet. Now, uh, all right, and here he is returning, or here is a really famous picture of the return of the people from Babylon back to Jerusalem. Now, th the next part of this lesson is so, so, so important because this is the importance of Hebrew names. You know, when people in the Jewish uh, tradition name their babies, they generally give them what we, we, you and I call Bible names, all right? And so they named them, and their names generally have a meaning in Hebrew. And Zachariah's name means God remembers. Isn't that beautiful? And when he was born in Babylon, his parents knew that the 70 years of exile were almost over. And so they reminded God by naming their baby, God remembers. Because God promised them through the prophet Jeremiah that they would be there 70 years and the exile would end. Look at Jeremiah 29 and let me show you that. Jeremiah 29 is one of the most famous chapters in the Bible. Because that's the chapter where it says, God, I have a God says, I have a plan for you. How many of you know that verse? I have a plan for you, a plan that will prosper you, a plan that will not harm you. Well, God gave that, first of all, to Jeremiah to give to the people who were in exile in Babylon. And God said, I want you to know, I will not forget you. Even though you think I have, I will not. So look at Jeremiah chapter 29. I love this chapter mainly because, well, all kinds of reasons, but I love to look at the context of a verse. I really, really, it bothers me when we just pick a verse up out of the Bible and claim it and we don't know the context. All right? The context of this verse, look at verse... Um, where is it? Let's just start verse 10 of Jeremiah 29. This is a letter that Jeremiah wrote to the exiles in Babylon. Did y'all know he wrote a letter to them? And how it got there, we don't know, except it went on a caravan into Babylon, probably on camels. And it's, this is what the letter says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise Underline that word promise. My gracious promise to bring you back to this place. And Zechariah's parents knew those 70 years were almost up. And they said, God will remember his what? His promise. 
stand, and you and I today are going to learn that song, Standing on the Promises of God. Look at verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. I have plans to prosper you and not to harm you. I have plans to give you hope and a future. Look at the, look at the context. Isn't that beautiful? God has a plan to give them hope, to give them prosperity, to give them a future. Does God have plans for you? Absolutely. And we can prove it when you read Ephesians. Because God says, I have a plan for you. I planned a plan for you before the beginning of the world was ever created. Verse 12, you call upon me and come and pray to me. And when you do, I will what? Ooh, is that true? Yes. Absolutely. Jesus said, seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Ask and it shall be given to you. That's what he just quoted Jeremiah, wasn't he? You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your what? Oh, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back from what? Captivity. Is this not a beautiful context to that verse? Is it not a beautiful promise that God gave to his people? Don't you know during the most sad times as they sang by the rivers of Babylon, don't you know they held on to that promise? He will bring them back. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. And today the Jews still claim that promise because there are Jews in exile cast, dispersed throughout the world. And God has said, I have a plan for Israel and I am going to bring them back. And it's still true. And that movement is starting and it's exciting to see how God is bringing the people back from dispersion throughout the world back to the nation of Israel. What a great thing. So let's look at our notes. Um, let number four. The name Zechariah means what? God remembers. And when he was born in Babylon, the 70 years of exile were almost over. And so when they, his parents named their baby, God remembers, what were they claiming? That they had faith in God. They trusted God to keep his promise. And so they're saying, will God remember his promise given to them by the prophet Jeremiah? Did he? Yes. By way of an unbelieving king named Cyrus. He brought them back. They got to come home, back to Babylon. All right, do we need any more questions on that? Number four, uh, Zechariah means what? His parents knew how many years of exile? Seventy were almost over. Naming their son God remembers was an expression of their faith. I'm going to name my next puppy God remembers. Would God remember his promise given to them by the prophet who? Jeremiah. All right. Now then, there. Uh, after Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I mean, after Zechariah wrote his prophecy, there was one more prophet, prophet named Malachi, and Malachi uh, gave his prophecy, and then there was silence from God. Silence. How long was there silence and no prophecies getting? Four hundred years. Don't you know? that the Jews were wondering if God is going to remember his promises. Let's look at something. I just love this next part of my lesson because we go to the New Testament and the first event recorded in the New Testament uh, was prophesied by Isaiah 700 years before the event happened. And it was prophesied by Malachi 400 years before it happened. The first event. What was it? Anybody know? The birth of Christ. Nope, not the birth of Christ. John the, Baptist. John the Baptist. Thank you, Alice. It was, it was, uh huh. The first event is the birth of John the Baptist. But even before John the Baptist, there was a priest in the temple. What was his name? Zachariah. What? Okay, 
The next to the last prophet in the Old Testament was named Zechariah. And the next event we see in the New, first event we see in the New Testament was recorded about a man named Zechariah. Now think about it. His parents named him God Remembers. So the next to the last prophet was named God Remembers. And the first event in the Bible, in the New Testament we read about, is a man named Zechariah. So uh, let's look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Malachi was, is the prophet that pastor is teaching on. And he is the last prophet in the Old Testament. And one of his last prophecies that he gives us is of a man 400 years later that we will know is named John. All right? So chapter 3, verse 1. Look at this. See, is everybody there? Is this what pastor preached on today? Chapter 3. He what? Preached on tithes. Tithes. Oh, that's chapter 3, verse 6. Well, he skipped a really important verse. I told you he's going to go through it too fast, didn't I? Chapter 3, verse 1, the prophecy of John the Baptist. I will send my messenger. He will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly, the Lord, the Messiah you are seeking, will come to his temple. They didn't even recognize Jesus when he came to his temple, didn't he? It's just kind of all of a sudden. And it says, the, mess, um, the messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Who was the messenger that we read about in Luke? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Now I want us to also look at uh, another prophecy of him. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40. I hope you're turning to your Bible because you've got to mark these places. Isaiah was the first major prophet, all right? He was 700 years before Jesus came. And he gives the prophecy of this same messenger. Let me tell you something. If, if these prophecies come true in 10 minutes or 700 years, I tell you they will come true. They will come about. Because look at Isaiah chapter, what did I say? 40, verse 3. This is the prophecy of, of the uh, of the Messiah, and we've heard all of this in Handel's Messiah, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, speak tenderly to Jerusalem, isn't that beautiful? And proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed. That sounds like Babylon, doesn't it? And her sin has been paid for. Now look at verse 3, a voice of one calling, do you see the call in your, does your Bible have a colon after the word col calling? Mark it out, okay? Here we, remember, punctuation is not um, inspired by God, okay? It's what the interpreters put in there. And they put the colon in the wrong place, I say. It should be after the word desert. A voice of one calling in the desert. Does that make better sense? So put your colon after the word desert. Got it? Shake your head yes at me. All right. And it reads like this. A, <laughs> I knew it. I knew there was a reason why I do not like these mechanical Bibles. Because you can't write in it, can you? Here we go. This is the way it reads. A voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Isn't that great? Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. What did John the Baptist say when he came and started baptizing in the River Jordan? Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? 700 years before he was born, Malachi prophesied 400 years before he was born. Now look over at Luke. It was finally fulfilled. I love the book of Luke. Luke was written by Luke. All right. He was a Greek. Now when I was a little girl, I just assumed he was a disciple until somebody said, are you kidding me? No, he wasn't a disciple. 
He was a follower of Paul. He was a Greek. We know him as a doctor. He was a physician. And he got, according to tradition, and it makes sense to me, he got his information mostly from Mary because we learned from Luke the birth of Jesus, and we don't hear about it in the other, in the other um, Gospels, except Matthew a little bit. And she tells us the story of the birth of John the Baptist. Now, only women do that, right? We're, only, we're the ones interested in how those little babies came about. And so she tells us the story, first of all, of John the Baptist and his parents. Uh, so I'm going to turn to Luke. Have you turned to Luke too? Okay. You love the Bible. Isn't it the most wonderful book? I love studying the Bible. So chapter 2, what chapter is it? 1. Chapter Luke, verse 1. This is cool. Uh, Verse 5. Luke 1, verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a what? Priest. Named what? What's Zechariah mean? God remembers, and of course his mama named him Zechariah because she said, does God remember his promise? Does he remember? And he belonged to the priestly division of Abijah, and you can find him in the Old Testament. Oh, now look at the next verse. So cool. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. What does the name Elizabeth mean? The oath of God. All right? The oath of God. And God in his providence introduced John, I mean, Zechariah, the priest, to Elizabeth. And his name means God remembers. His na- her name means oath of God. Now, what if you put those two names together? God remembers the oath of of God. God remembers his oath. And so we have this couple and their name together means God remembers his oath. Is that not a miracle? And they had a baby boy and the angel Gabriel came to Zechariah in the in the temple and he said, Zechariah, you and your wife are old I know she's barren, but in the fullness of time, she's going to have a baby. Oh, don't you know they were excited? Can you imagine? And he said, and you're going to name your baby John. And Zachariah said, are you kidding me? We're too old. And the angel says, because you haven't believed me, he said, you will not be able to talk for nine months until that baby is born. So he didn't talk. And so when he was born, Elizabeth, the oath of God, says our baby's name is John. And Zechariah wrote on a tablet, his name is John. And you'll find that in the book of Luke, chapter 1. You've got to go home and read that. Raise your hand and promise me you will go home and read Luke 1. We will find that Elizabeth and Jesus' mother, Mary, are... Cousins. Do you know what the name John means? God's grace. The grace of God. So listen. Zechariah, God remembers. And his wife Elizabeth, the oath of God. God remembers his oath. They have a baby boy and it results in God's grace and mercy. The whole gospel right there in three names. I love that, and I hope you do. So listen, I found all that. I didn't, I didn't invent that. I, I found all that in this book that Cheryl gave me. And it's called uh, Book of Mysteries by Jonathan Kahn. And you will find the story of Zechariah the prophet and Zechariah the priest of Luke chapter 1 on pages 164 and 205. I hope you all go get that book because it's just full of great stories like that. And listen to how he ended this. 
when Zechariah gave... Oh, look at Luke 1, verse 72. I wanted to sh- got to show you this. Luke 1, verse 72. Zechariah sings a song when his baby boy is born. And just to show you how this works, look at verse 72. God remembered his holy covenant. He remembered the oath he swore to our father Abraham. There's his name. God remembers his oath. God remembers his covenant. And he shows mercy to our fathers. I just think that is so beautiful. Listen to what Jonathan Kahn said. Uh, When Zechariah gave praise to God, this is the priest, he would declare that God had performed the miracle to remember his holy covenant, to remember the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. Never forget, no matter how long it takes, whether centuries or moments, God will never forget his what? He will never forget his promise and never break his word. Never. Out of the broken, the barren, and in the impossible, the grace of God will be born. Now, I said, okay, Lord, let's see some more promises that you've given to us that you will never forget. I don't have time, but I want you to look at letter B at the bottom of your page. On what promises are we counting on God to fulfill for us? Because he has still given us some that have not been fulfilled. It's been 2,000 years since the angel told the disciples that Jesus will return. 2,000 years. Has he forgotten Do you ever wonder, has God forgotten that promise? Well, we're going to read a little bit, but I want you to look at um, um, Isaiah 49. Oh, wait a minute. I know what I wanted to tell you. I lost my mind there a minute. Look at your newsletter at the back for our one anothering page. Is it there? Is it on the back? Okay. At the bottom of the one anothering page is study his word. Got it? Okay, it's on the back of your newsletter. Is that correct? Okay. Number three, study his word. See it? There are all the verses that are on the bottom of your lesson page 58. But I want us to look at right now at number two, Isaiah 49. And please open your Bibles, and this is your homework for this week, to fill this out. These are the promises that God has given us that I know that He's going to fulfill someday, but here's what God said about Himself. And this is an Isaiah. Look at me when you find Isaiah 49. Sound like a second grade teacher, and I apologize. Isaiah 49, verse 14. But Zion said, that's Jerusalem. They're in captivity. And they said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has what? Forgotten Forgotten me. Isn't that sad? And all of us get to those times in our lives where we think God may have forsaken us where we think maybe God has forgotten. And and it's distress and and depression and sadness and no no energy. Anybody ever get there? And we think the Lord has forgotten me. Look at what God says about himself in verse 15. I love this. You see, most of the time in the Bible, God is portrayed to us as the father. Strong, tough, suck it up kind of guy, right? But he also has this tender, tender heart like a mother. And he says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast? Now, what's the answer to that? No, that's a rhetorical question. 
We know the answer to that, of course not. He says, can a mother forget her baby? Can a mother have no compassion on the child she has born? Remember when your baby or your little boy or little girl fell and cut her knee? What's a mama do? You just take that baby up and cuddle him and tell him it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. That's what he's saying. This is God's feeling toward his children as well. Verse 15. If at all, I mean, we can't imagine it, but if she should forget her baby, God says, I will not what? Forget you. Thank you, God. Thank you that you'll not forget us. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Now to engrave, that word means to cut. So God has us tattooed on his hands. Not one of you better come tomorrow and have your th hands tattooed, okay? It would hurt really bad. But God said, I have you engraved tattooed on my hands and he says and your walls are ever before me I think the wall and I've really had to do some research and I think what it means by the walls is your face your face your face is ever before me so look at your notes on number two on studying his word Isaiah 49 got it Okay, this is the back of your newsletter in red. Zion said, and instead of Zion, write your name there. What? I'm just repeating. Okay, no, you got no, I'm it? Reading it. This is what the, like, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord is what? Forgotten. forgotten me. Can a mother forget, forget the baby at her breast? Can a mother have no compassion. compassion on the child she has born? Though she may, what? Forget. forget. And we know that's not possible. God says, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. All God has to do is just look right here. And he sees your name. And he says, your face or your walls are ever before me. Is that the most beautiful thing you've ever heard? And you see, the story of Zechariah, as we're going to read it, his parents named him God Remembers. 400 years later, we meet another man named Zechariah. His parents named him God Remembers. And both of these events are when God remembered two very important things. And we must always remember that God has not forgotten us. God has us tattooed on the palm of his hands. He will not forget you. So look at number four on your notes. Um, study his word. Revelation 22. Uh, I'm just going to turn over to Revelation 22 because the last chapter in the book. And it's been prophesied 2,000 years ago. But God said he's not going to forget. Where is Revelation? There it is. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Jesus says, Behold, I am what? Coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. Look at verse 20. Again, Jesus says and testifies to these things. Yes, I am what? Coming soon. Coming soon. Amen. And we all say what together? Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. That's our prayer. Come, Lord Jesus. 2,000 years ago, has he forgotten? No. God has not forgotten. You know why he's tarrying? You know why God has told Jesus not to come yet? Because he's waiting for everybody who wants to come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ to come. 
He is waiting for them to come. But don't tarry too long. All right? So Revelation number 4, Jesus said, <clears throat> Look, I am what? Coming. coming soon. Yes, I am coming soon. And we say, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray because people are going to want to come in. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that you're not a man that you will lie. You're not a person that you would change your mind. But when you have promised something, you will do it. And when you have said you will do something, you'll make it good. We trust you, Father. We trust you that you will not forget us, that you will keep all of your promises to us. Thank you for the two Zacharias of the Bible, the last man of the Old Testament and the first man of the New Testament, that they both re say, God remembers. Thank you, Father. And we give you all the glory and all the power and the honor and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for letting me be your teeth. Thank you for letting me be your teeth. Thank you for letting me be your teeth. Thank you for letting me be your teeth.